Hello, and welcome to So VT Book Talk. I'm your host, Karen Simpson McVicker, and I'm so excited to welcome you to episode four. This month, I am joined again by the wonderful Jess Hunsicker, who is the events coordinator at Northshire Bookstore in Manchester, Vermont. Hey, Jess. Hi, Karen. It's so nice to see you again. Oh, yes, it's so nice to see you too. <laughs> Yeah, we always have so much fun doing this. Uh, but you have brought a wonderful guest who I am so excited to meet and so excited to learn everything about. And would you like to introduce her today? I would love to introduce her. We are joined today by Kimmerer Lamote, who is an advocate for dance in everything she does. Um, an award-winning author, dancer, scholar of religion. She is the author of six nonfiction books each one offering a different take on how dancing opens new possibilities for thinking, feeling, and living. She has written the book, lyrics, and music for two musicals, and is currently writing a middle grade book and a young adult near future dystopian trilogy. Kimmerer lives with her life partner and two of their five children on a homestead in Hebron, New York, where the family takes care of two calves five Jersey cows, six hens, three cats, and a large vegetable garden. So welcome to the show, Kimmer. It's great to have you here. Thank Author, you. scholar, playwright, farmer. I really don't even know what my first question is. So I'd really like to turn it over to you and hear what you would like to share with us today about your work. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you, Jess. I'm just delighted to be here with you all. And I'm delighted to have an opportunity to talk about my work. So what I'd like to talk about today are these three books, actually. What a Body Knows, Family Planting, and Why We Dance. And they're what I call my farm books. So in 2005, my family and I moved from the Boston area to a farm in upstate New York. And I had spent 15 of my years at Harvard 15 years of my life at Harvard, doing a PhD and then teaching, being on the faculty, doing fellowships, writing two books for academics. And I had come to the point that I really needed to write books that communicated what I was working on in my scholarship to a wider audience. Mm -hmm. So I wrote the kind of books that I most love to read. Those are books that shift your horizons, that take something that's very familiar and very close to you and make you see it in a completely new light from a different angle. And the thing that I wanted to shift our experience of was bodies, what it means to be a body. As you mentioned, I'm a dancer. And in my scholarly work, I work on dance within the Christian tradition. And for a long time, my work was driven by the question, why don't Christians dance? <laughs> because when you look at religious traditions around the world, dance is oftentimes integral, integral to their spiritual life. It's a medium of religious experience, a medium of religious expression, and I wanted to know why in my mainstream Protestant Christian church we weren't dancing, right? So that got me looking at philosophy and theology, trying to figure out what is the relationship between mind and body that we are taught as citizens of the West. We grow up with this sense of ourselves as being minds who live inside bodies. We, think of, we come to think about bodies as material objects that I, my mind, I am responsible for. I'm responsible for what my body does. I'm responsible for how my body fits in. I'm responsible for keeping my body sitting still. And this mind over body way of thinking about ourselves, I've come to believe is the cause of a number of different crises that we ex are experiencing in our culture today. Health crises, relationship crises, relationship to the environment crises. So what I wanted to do was to shift this mind over body way of thinking about ourselves and come up with a different way that allows us to move differently in our lives. So from my work in dance, and in particular my work with the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, mm -hmm. I came to an understanding that actually our bodies are not things that we have, we are bodies. And the bodies that we are are not things, they're movement. Our bodies are movement. They're not things that move, they are movement. They're moving in every second of our lives, creating us into who we are. You can just think about it in terms of breathing, mm -hmm. your heart beating, your neurons connecting. You know, a body that is not moving is not a body, it's a corpse. So I took this idea 
to try to think about, Nietzsche has a great way of talking about it. He says, a body does not say I, a body does I. So what would it mean to think about our bodies as movement? So I set for myself a task to rate these three books. And what a body knows, I would figure out what it meant to think about our bodies and movement in terms of our relationships to ourselves, our relationships to our own sensation, and in particular, our relationships to our desires, our desires for food, our desires for sex, our desires for spirit. And then I wanted to write a book that we th thought about what it would mean to think about, about our bodies and movement in relationship to the primary relationships into our in our lives, our relationships with our parents or caregivers, our relationships with our partners, our relationships with our progeny, or those things that we take care of. And then I wrote the book that connected those two together and brought it in relationship to the natural world. How can we reconceive our relationship to the natural world in terms of movement? Wow. <laughs> and so how long did this project take? I mean, these are three very distinct books that are all connected. How long did it take you to bring all three of these books to life? Yes. Well, I published this one in 2009 and this one in 2015. So I probably started writing it soon after we got to the farm. Uh, so that was about 2007. Wow. So about two, mm -hmm. to 2015. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. And you know, what's your process of bringing these to people? You talked about wanting to create books that were going to connect with a wider audience. How yes. have you been able to do that, to, to get these books out there to people? Yes, that's a challenge always. I've done a lot of radio interviews. I've done talks at Northshire for both this book and this book, <laughs> book readings. Um, I've done uh, other, I've uh, written blog. I have a blog at Psychology Today, and I've written over 100 blog posts talking about different aspects of all of these books. Um, so it's a, just an ongoing process of, of sharing, the, sharing the, the word, as it were. <laughs> And then help me make the connection between this work and now you're kind of making this movement into some fiction and particularly for younger readers. So talk to me about that journey a little bit. Yes, well, once I got to the end of these three, I thought, okay, I finished the project that I had sent to myself, set for myself and moving to the farm. And then I thought, well, what do I wanna do next? And at that time, um, I was still, even though I haven't been actively teaching in the academy, I've still kept one foot in the scholarly world. I'm writing scholarly articles, I'm going to conferences, I'm um, teaching workshops, I travel around and give lectures. But I was feeling, my children were growing up, they were reading all of this amazing young adult literature, and in all of this young, literature, young adult literature, I was finding the same problem that I found in the <laughs> theology and philosophy of the modern West, and that there was this mind over body way of thinking about ourselves and responding to ourselves. And so I thought, wow, what if I could write a young adult novel in which dance was a superpower? in which actually the experience of moving and of learning to sense, to respond to our sensations and our feelings was the story of the novel. So that's what got me writing the young adult novels. And where is that, uh, where is that book? Where, at what stage in that process are you right now? Right, so the first um, novel of the young adult tr trilogy that I'm planning, I haven't finished yet, okay. is called Earth Keeper. And I'm in the process of finding a literary agent for that book. Okay. So I'm querying, sending out queries, and I have two agents right now who are reading the full manuscript. Mm -hmm. So fingers crossed, yeah. something will happen. And, and for anybody who doesn't, isn't familiar with that term querying, when, uh, when a writer has a manuscript, they write what's called a query letter, although now it's often an email or an online form, and they are looking for either a literary agent or a small press that's interested in their manuscript. So that whole process is called querying, just in case anybody <laughs> has never heard it before. Wondering, right. I know, <laughs> wondering what that is. Right. Well, that's really exciting. So you already yeah. have two people looking at it. Right. And then you mentioned also a middle grade novel. So talk to me about that. Right. Well, that also came out of, so, so one of the things that happened when we moved to the farm is that our children, you mentioned we have five children, mm -hmm. and they decided they wanted to be farmers. Now, Jeffrey and I were artists. I moved so I could dance and write. Jeffrey moved so he could do his music. The children decide they're gonna be farmers. And all of a sudden, we realize we, instead of like dancing and writing and playing music, we're out shoveling muck in the barn <laughs> and, and trying to think about, okay, what's happening here? And we found that there was this amazing synergy that as we helped the children realize their desires and their dreams, 
the experiences that we were having helped us realize ours. Mm -hmm. And that story is in this family planting, actually, mm -hmm. um, that this, this sort of amazing back and forth, insofar as I wanted to be able to live in the natural world, doing my work in mm -hmm. a way that I could not not be moved to move by the movement of the natural world, right? Um, I envisioned walking through nature, coming back to my study and writing about it, right? And the kids are here out <laughs> getting me like milking a cow, making cheese, taking care of horses, and I'm realizing, you know, that's exactly what I needed. You know, our relationship to nature is not just one of passing through. Mm. Our relationship to nature needs to be one of engagement. How are we actually participating in the ongoing evolution of the earth. What are the movements that we are making, creating every moment that we do? So as a result of those experiences, I had all of these farm stories. And so I thought, what can I do with these farm stories? Now, one of the other books that was so inspirational for my kids was Farmer Boy by Laura Ingalls Wilder. <laughs> Little House on the Prairie was the second. And so I was reading these books with them and I'm thinking, these are wonderful books, but they are not written for the 21st century. And so what if I tried to write kind of a Laura Ingalls Wilder book for the 21st century that actually dealt with issues of racism and environmental um, issues? So um, the book that I'm working on right now is a middle grade book in which the character, the protagonist, who's a 12 year old girl, loosely based on different aspects of my five children, um, is friends, meets a Mexican boy who's the son of a migrant worker who's working with the local dairies. And this is based on a true story experienced by one of my children. Oh, great. And so through that, through the eyes of that, through that friendship, she comes to realize the, the really heartbreaking realities of immigration policy in the mm -hmm. U.S. Wow. Ooh, so where are you with that book? That sounds really good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just had two wonderful readers read that book, including you. Thank you very much, Karen. <laughs> I didn't want to up with that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, and I'm currently working on, I've got one more reader reading it now. Okay. And then I've got a query letter all set to go. And so I hope to query that one too. And would you so, see that potentially becoming a series? Like the Little House stories? Yes. There was a yes. series of them. And you said yes. you have a lot of farm stories. I do. The Blue House books is what I'm thinking about them right now. Oh, we have a Blue House. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> uh, well, that was also something. When I came to the farm, I wanted a blue house. That was just, I wanted a blue house. I don't know why, but there we go. And I think we have just a few more, a few more minutes here. I'm curious, just to go back, what was the, the inciting incident or conversation between you and your partner that made you buy a farm in upstate New York? What made you decide to move? Right. Just real quickly, I'd love to know. Yeah, that's a great question. Even from the first time we met in the early 90s, we had a dream of moving to the country and creating a center for arts and ideas. So that was like in 1990. We were married in 92. We were still um, you know, working at jobs in the city, getting the kind of skills that we needed. And after our second child was born in 1997, I got a job teaching at Harvard, and Jeffrey had a job designing keyboards. And I looked at him and I said, we have this dream. We have two jobs. We do not need two jobs. Why don't one of us quit, do our art, the other person will be primary caregiver and have four to six hours a day to work on their art in, as a way of getting us to the farm. Okay. So that started what we called our five-year plan. <laughs> okay. And that's really how it started. So Jeffrey was an artist for, in the Boston area for five years, which stretched to seven because I was able to get some grants while I was teaching at Harvard. And then it was time to switch. And right at that time that it was time to switch, Jessica, our daughter, who was seven years old, to whom we had promised animals once we moved to the country, decided she was gonna make it happen. And so in all of her seven-year-old wisdom, she sat down at the computer and she Googled farms in Vermont. And she found this Vermont border farm. <laughs> and I took a look at it and I was like, wow, that's interesting. And we talked to Jeffrey and we were like, wow, that's interesting. And we were right at that point where it was just seeming like it was time. So it was a, a long process, but I, and I also tell aspects of that in both of mm -hmm. these two books. Well, I love this this underlying theme that your children are actually making a lot of this happen yes. for you all. So that's really yes. amazing. Yes. Well, we are so excited to have you on the show and talk about your work. And how can people, if they want to find out more about what you're doing, do you have a website or a blog you want to send them to? Is there a spot they can find you? Yes, that would be great. I mean, all these books are available on Amazon, Barnes okay. & Noble, all online sites. Mm -hmm. um, 
And you can find more information at my website, which is KimmerLamote.com. Okay, great. Kimmer, yeah. thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you. Thanks. It was a pleasure. And now we are joined by Paige Vignola, who is the Assistant Director of the Manchester Community Library. Hello, Paige. Fantastic to be back. Nice to see you again. So we are going to move into our last now next segment, where we talk mm -hmm. about the last book we read, the book we're reading now, and what we're excited to be reading next. Do you want to go first, Jess? Because I know yeah. Jess is really excited with I, her stuff this month. I am really excited. There was a little bit of a theme to my reads. Um, I decided to do some history stuff, which is like one of my loves, my undergraduate degrees in history. I love history. So, but I have a wide variety of different types of historical things to talk about today. The first one is this really beautiful big countertop kind of book uh, called Cheap Old Houses. If you're familiar with the Instagram account, these guys run like an Instagram where they post cheap old houses and um, some people have bought houses through this Instagram. A lot of people have and they fix them up and they're kind of these like beautiful wonderful success stories and it took off and they have like a newsletter they have like an HGTV show and they're local to the area they live in uh, like Greenwich New York uh, so and they're super cool and this book is just gorgeous they there's um, some different books that are actually or homes rather that are like local and one of them one of my favorite ones is the owl pen bookstore mm -hmm. right in Greenwich there's an entire like spread about that bookstore oh that's beautiful yeah it's wonderful this is Sydney she's one of the owners and she's going to library school right now she's very cool they're both very cool so this book is awesome if you're really interested in architecture if you're interested in local history uh, if you're interested in home renovation there's just so many beautiful like very inspiring photos in here I'm renovating a cheap old house myself right now so I was just so excited when I saw that this was coming out and it did not disappoint. Um, and then second, I just started reading The Art Thief by Michael Finkel. He's the man who wrote Stranger in the Woods, um, which I haven't read, but has been on my TBR pile for a while. And so this is nonfiction and um, it's all about this man who within like recent years, like the last, you know, like I think early aughts, if not late 90s, maybe until like the mid aughts, uh, he pulled it off like 200, more than 200 different heists, and he stole a lot of very valuable artwork. And um, he eventually was caught, you know, as you know, his own hubris, I think, mm -hmm. kind of caught up with him. And it tells you that story of what led up to that. And the very most interesting thing about him that I've found is he wasn't reselling the things he was stealing. He was displaying them in his own home. <laughs> Like, he built his own museum of all of his stolen artwork. He was populating his own museum. Yeah. Wow. Fabulous. So okay. it's just like a really interesting character of a guy. Um, and this is, it's really fun. Uh, it's it's fast paced, but and it's a quick read. I highly recommend. And this I haven't read yet. This is my next. And uh, we've had a lot of people recommend this. Mm -hmm. um, some of our booksellers have been really into it. It's called The Frozen River. And it's a novel, but it's based on historical fact. And it's about this real life woman who I believe her name is, oh, I really should know, um, Martha Ballard. Yes. And she was a midwife. And this book takes place in the late 18th century and she was like very fascinating because she kept memoirs mm -hmm. um, like hundreds of pages of memoirs we still have them oh, and fantastic. she detailed like everything oh, wow. that happened in the town births deaths crime like property exchange like everything uh, and then also like a lot of like juicy details <laughs> about all of those things it's gonna make a social historian salivate for sure <laughs> oh, <really? Yeah. laughs> and so this is like a novelization of something that happened to her where she had basically she investigated what she considered was like a, a murder mm. there was a man in this river who was he was found entombed in ice um, in like 1786 and like the town kind of like wanted to brush it off as an accident. She she knew what actually had happened, oh. and uh, so this well, is supposed really to go good. into so a little bit of a murder detail. mystery, a little bit of a murder mystery, okay. a historical fiction, but very much inspired by very historical nice. fact. I'm very excited for well, this. That sounds exciting. That is really that's really. not usually my genre, but you've sold it well. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna have to pick that one up. And Paige, what are you reading these days? 
Well, okay, so I'm kind of all over the map these days. Um, so my last book uh, is, I actually just finished rereading A Christmas Carol, which I do oh, every year. Um, it's sort of, uh, I mean, you know, it's it, you sit down and within a night you're done uh, so with A Christmas though. Carol. But I just, uh, I love the Victorian ghost stories uh, in, in the wintertime. Um, so, uh, and I don't think people really appreciate just how funny Charles Dickens really was. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, that was my last. Uh, I wanted to get that one in under the wire so that I wasn't, uh, you know, missing out for, for my for my holiday tradition. Um, my current book, my now book, is actually one that I probably would never have picked up, but I have had I'm going to say somewhere around five to six. Uh, high school age individuals tell me that I 100% need to read this book. So I started reading The Fourth Wing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I'm not 100% into dragons, right? I, you know, like I'm, I'm more, if I'm going to yeah. do dragons, I'm more like along the smog side of things. But mm. um, it's, uh, it's interesting. I, I appreciate the fact that the book is um, trying to draw attention to political realities within the, the environment that it has created. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little on the risque side for mm -hmm. me. Uh, I, you know, I think my, my oldest child referred to it as dragon porn, but once you get past <laughs> the dragon porn aspects of it, it is kind of entertaining. Um, only about uh, a third of the way through that one, but uh, okay. I expect I'll be uh, finishing that one up. Uh, and then my next is, uh, well, we had talked about um, my tendency to find an author and then read everything that author has yes. ever written. Um, so I had to set down for a variety of reasons uh, my, my following of Alex Harrow. So now I, my next book is The 10,000 Doors of January. Okay. And I am super excited about that because I just love the way she writes. Yeah. I love and you've got me style. adding her to my TBR pile too, so I'm really excited. Oh, I mean, it's every page just like, oh, that's beautiful. And I have a tendency to, um, as a uh, recovering English teacher, I have a tendency to <laughs> annotate most books as I as I right. read them. So I've got a pencil next to me and I always have mm -hmm. my little sticky tabs. And so I, you know, mark off passages that I just have to come back to at a later oh, date. Great. And I find myself with her quite frequently coming back to thematically that's lovely or just the just the musicality of this yes. phrase. And yeah, so okay. and that's well, my, you're that's selling her pretty well, pretty yeah. well, too. <laughs> So my last book, I have to come clean. Some people watch Hallmark movies at the holidays. I always read sort of a, just like a Christmas romance every year. And I usually, I'm on BookBub, which is like a newsletter, and they'll let you know if there are any um, really great deals on eBooks. So I picked up The Christmas Star <laughs> okay. by Marianne McFadden, which turned out to be, you know, the typical kind of Hallmark scenario, but a single mom going home. But it was to Hackettstown, New Jersey, which I found fascinating because I'm a Jersey girl. I grew up in New Jersey. Anyway, it was a lovely read. You know, last year I read The Christmas Bookshop by Jenny Colgan. Oh, yeah. They're all that's a sweet read. So that's kind of like you have to do mm -hmm. your Christmas Carol every season. I always pick up just a sweet holiday romance, and I really enjoyed it. It was a really lovely read. Um, but my right now book is this book, Wayward, Oh My Gosh, by Amelia Hart. This is a, a wonderful read. I absolutely loved it. I'm like, practically, I probably could have finished it before we went on the show. Um, it's so great. And it has three points of view in three different centuries. So this is about um, a lineage of women who in 1619, one is accused of witchcraft, but they're definitely, it's a family of women who have very strong ties to nature, the natural world and our healers. So you have one of the women is in 1619, another one is in 1942, and then the third is in 2019. And so I, I loved it. So if you enjoy sort of, you know, Alice Hoffman or, you know, Sarah Penner, what things like that. I think you would really, really love this book. Do the narratives intertwine or? They, they do through um, kind of like we're saying the memoirs. So they do, there is the story that was written down mm -hmm. um, by um, the woman in 1619. So everyone gets connected through okay. the story and through some animals that play a really strong role in that. So it's, it was really fun. I loved it. It was exactly, you know, when it's exactly what you were looking mm -hmm, for. Mm -hmm. So it was exactly what I was looking for. And then my next book is interesting because it's The General and Julia. And we had this author, John Clinch, on the show. And then he was at North Shire Bookstore. But at my last book group meeting, several of the people in my book group recommended it. And then I was able to kind of speak to it. And this is actually the copy I got for my husband for Christmas, but hadn't wrapped it yet. <laughs> 
<laughs> and it's signed, like he personalized it. I got John to sign it for yeah. Joe. So I'll wrap it under the tree. Yeah. I may have to read, I'm almost done with this. I may have to put something else in between <laughs> so that Joe can open this and then let me read it for book group. Uh, but so that's, Here's your gift, now let me have now it back. Me have it back. <laughs> I think he's still reading the follow-up though to the fourth wing. He's reading the Iron, oh, Iron Flame. Iron mm -hmm. Flame. So that is a bit of phenomenon. So you'll feel good. You're in on the phenomenon yeah. that is the fourth wing and the Iron Flame. So, uh, so you're so many, cool. So many kids telling me I had to read it. I so know. Yeah, that's great. But dragon porn, that was funny. <laughs> yeah. So now I want to hear what's happening. Let, what's happening at the library? Why don't you go yeah. first? Tell us what's going on um, okay so January we kind of uh, pulled it back just a little bit I went a little overboard I think planning for December so January kind of pulling it back a little bit but um, we do still have every Wednesday afternoon the creativity cave oh, uh, which is an after-school art group uh, that is sponsored by the Vermont Community Foundation it's um, from 3.30 till 5 uh, every Wednesday each week we have a different local artist come in in order to be able to do different projects. Great. For the month of January, we've got Stacey Gates, oh. we've got Lauren Cabus, who I've got, and Harrod Llewellyn, I've got, you know, Casey Junker Bailey, we've got all kinds of amazing stuff that's coming in. Um, so anybody, uh, again, this is an after-school program, so it's not designed for adults. And I, I specifically say that because I've had a number of adults who say, well, why can't, <laughs> <laughs> Why can't we do these things for, for bigger people? Well, because that's not the grant. <laughs> um, but because of that, Lauren Cabus, who is uh, Vermont Macrame, she has uh, agreed to do a workshop uh, in the month of January. So January 20th, she's going to be doing a macrame oh, workshop great. that adults are actually allowed to okay. attend. Awesome. Um, because she's been coming in for macrame a lot for the kids. And um, yeah, so we needed to branch out and, and, and let uh, anybody over the age of 18 join in again. Um, but in addition to that, we've got um, a community potluck get together that's going to be starting in January. Um, so this is a once a month gathering for community and diversity. And it's going to be the third Thursday of every month um, for January. That makes it January 18th and it's from five to seven. And people are encouraged to, if they wish, uh, bring a dish that's maybe representative of their heritage. Um, there's going to be just, you know, kind of get together right, and, and uh, you know, just sort of make it a big community gathering. Oh, that's um, great. Yeah, so I'm looking, really looking forward to that. Um, we're also going to be um, having a really phenomenal exhibition taking place in the library. So the library walls, we have uh, um, frequently and about every six to eight weeks, uh, artists come in in order to be able to do gallery uh, displays. Um, and uh, in January, we're gonna have, um, it's actually a, a joint presentation between Vermont Folklife Center and uh, St. Joseph's Orphanage Restorative Inquiry. Um, and so this is uh, the Voices of St. Joseph's. So it's an exhibition presented uh, that tells the story of the former orphans of St. Joseph's Orphanage and their uh, enduring and remarkable accomplishments. Um, and so that is uh, opening up, and I didn't write down my day. Um, um, yeah, I can't remember which day it is. I apologize. Uh, I didn't write that one down. Uh, but that is going to be opening up in January, and it will be on the the uh, library website and all the information there. So okay. um, awesome. Well, that sounds like a great month, Paige. I'm excited. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff. It's uh, uh, some some fun things, but uh, uh, fewer events in the evenings because we know that nobody really wants to be driving home in the snow in the dark at night. Yeah, exactly. So fewer well, evening great. events this month. And Jess, yeah. what's happening at Northshire? Yeah, we've got some fun stuff in the works. Uh, the first event, we're kicking it off. We're kind of taking a little bit of a break for that first week of January, but then starting on January 9th, that's Tuesday, we're doing a virtual event as a way to kind of like mm -hmm. give some people some time to be at home and not have to come out. And that's going to be featuring Bruce Dorsey uh, in his book uh, called Murder in a mill town, and that's mm. supposed to be like a riveting chronicle of one of the first like trials of the century, like in this country. Um, so it's like old history, but sounds very interesting to me. And then we're going to have organic farmer, army vet, and author Bill Fulton. He's going to be coming to talk about his book that's all about like um, emergency preparedness that's called it has the funniest title it's called survive and thrive how to prepare for any disaster without ammo camo or eating your neighbor <laughs> <laughs> excellent <laughs> okay and so he'll be at the bookstore on january 19th uh, that's a saturday at six okay. uh, and then sheila liming is going to be coming for her event all about the importance of personal connection um, hanging out uh, and that will be Friday, January 19th at 6. I'm very excited to see her again. And then we have another farmer coming, Scott Chasky. 
Uh, and he's more like an activist and a poet. Um, and he's been to the store before to do events. He'll be coming back to talk about his latest collection of essays called Soil and Spirit. Uh, and that's all about food sovereignty and like mm -hmm. sustainable mm -hmm. agriculture mm -hmm. and whatnot. And that will be on Friday the 26th at 6. And the last event for the month is one that I'm running. I'm going to be doing a, an elephant and piggy story time with oh. one of our booksellers. <laughs> I love those Excellent. books. So that's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to have some crafts. Um, yeah, it's going to wow. be a good time. That's on Saturday the 27th at 2. Great. My wow. kids are way too old for Elephant and Piggy, and I have not been able to let go of any of those books. Like, they're <laughs> just sitting so there on the fun. shelf. And I said to my children, it's like, oh, you know, maybe we should, you know, we should give those to your cousin, right? Hudson is the right age. <laughs> Both of my kids are like, you can't get rid of Elephant and Piggy. <laughs> oh, well, it sounds like an incredible start to the new year. And thank you both for starting the show with me and being here every month. I just love spending time with you. And I hope, I think our viewership is growing. So thank you for joining us. And until next time, we're just wishing everyone a happy and healthy new year and enjoy uh, some great new books in 2024. We'll see you next time. <laughs>